Chapter Twenty Five of Montezuma's Daughter, by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Twenty Five, The Burying of Montezuma's Treasure. Quitlahua was crowned emperor of the Aztecs, in succession to his brother Montezuma while I lay sick with the wound given me by the sword of de Garcia, and also with that I had received on the altar of the sacrifice. This hurt had found no time to heal, and in the fierce fighting on the night of fear it burst open and bled much. Indeed, it gave me trouble for years, and to this hour I feel it in the autumn season. Artemie, who nursed me tenderly, and so strange is the heart of woman, even seemed to be consoled in her sorrow at the loss of her father and nearest kin, because I had escaped the slaughter and won fame, told me of the ceremony of the crowning, which was splendid enough. Indeed the Aztecs were almost mad with rejoicing because the Teules had gone at last. They forgot or seem to forget the loss of thousands of their bravest warriors and of the flower of their rank and as yet at any rate they did not look forward to the future from house to house and street to street ran troops of young men and maidens garlanded with flowers saying the chills are gone rejoice with us the chills are fled and woe to them who would not marry, ay, even though their houses were desolate with death. And also the statues of the gods were set up again on the great pyramid, and their temples rebuilt, the holy crucifix that Spaniards had placed there being served as the idol Sweetsel and Tescat had been served, and tumbled down the side of the Teocli and that after sacrifice of some Spanish prisoners had been offered in its presence. It was Guatemoc himself who told me of this sacrilege, but not with any exultation, for I had taught him something of our faith, and though he was too sturdy a heathen to change his creed, in secret he believed that the God of the Christians was a true and mighty God. Moreover, though he was obliged to countenance them, because of the power of the priests, like Otomi, Guatemoc never loved the horrid rites of human sacrifice. Now when I heard this tale, my anger overcame my reason, and I spoke fiercely, saying, I am sworn to your cause, Guatemoc, my brother, and I am married to your blood, but I tell you that from this hour it is an accursed cause because of your blood-stained idols and your priests it is accursed that god whom you have desecrated and those who serve him shall come back in power and he shall sit where your idols sat and none shall stir him for ever oh, thus i spoke and my words were true though i do not know what put them into my heart since i spoke at random in my wrath for to-day Christ's church stands on the site of the place of sacrifice in Mexico, a sign of triumph of his triumph over devils, and there it shall stand while the world endures. You speak rashly, my brother, Guatemoc answered, proudly enough, though I saw him quail at the evil omen of my words. I say speak rashly, and were you overheard there are those notwithstanding the rank we have given you the honour which you have won in war and council and that you have passed stone of sacrifice who might force you to look again upon the faces of the beings you blaspheme what worse thing has been done to your christian god than has been done again and again to our gods by your white kindred but let us talk no more of this matter and i pray you my brother do not utter such ill-omened words to me again lest it should strain our love do you then believe that the tules will return ay guatemoc 
so surely as to-morrow's sun shall rise. When you held quarters in your hand, you let him go, and since then he has won a victory at Ottompen. Is he a man, think you, to sheathe the sword that he has once drawn, and go into darkness and dishonour? Before a year is past, the Spaniards will be back at the gates of Tenochtitlan. Oh, you are no comforter to-night, brother, said Guatemoc, and yet I fear that your words are true. Well, if we must fight, let us strive to win. Now at least there is no Montezuma to take the viper to his breast and nurse it till it stings him. Then he rose and went in silence, and I saw that his heart was heavy. On the morrow of this talk I could leave my bed, and within a week I was almost well. Now it was that Guatemoc came to me again, saying that he had been bidden by Quitlahoa, the Emperor, to command me to accompany him, Guatemoc, on a service of trust and secrecy and indeed the nature of the service showed how great a confidence the leaders of the Aztecs now placed in me, for it was none other than the hiding away of the treasure that had been recaptured from the Spaniards on the night of fear, and with it much more from the secret stores of the empire. At the fall of darkness we started. Some of the great lords, Guatemoc and I, and coming to the water's edge, we found ten large canoes, each laden with something that was hidden by cotton cloths. Into these canoes we entered secretly, thinking that no one saw us, three to a canoe, for there were thirty of us in all, and led by Guatemoc. We paddled for two hours or more across the lake of Tezcuco, till we reached the further shores at a spot where the prince had a fairy state. Here we landed, and the cloths were withdrawn from the cargoes of the canoes, which were great jars and sacks of gold and jewels, besides many other precious objects, among them a likeness of the head of Montezuma, fashioned in solid gold, which was so heavy that it was as much as Guatemoc and I could do to lift between us. As for the jars, of which, if my memory serves me, there were seventeen, Six men must carry each of them, by the help of paddles, lashed on either side, and then the task was not light. All this priceless stuff we bore in several journeys to the crest of a rise, six hundred paces distance from the water, setting it down by the mouth of the shaft behind the shelter of a mound of earth. When everything was brought up from the boats, Guatemoc touched me and another man, a great Aztec noble, born of a Tlascan mother, on the shoulder, asking us if we were willing to descend with him into the hole, and there to dispose of the treasure. Oh, gladly, I answered, for I was curious to see the place, but the noble hesitated a while, though in the end he came with us to his ill fortune. Then Guatemoc took torches in his hand and was lowered into the shaft by a rope. Next came my turn, and down I went, hanging to the cord like a spider to its thread, and the hole was very deep. At length I found myself standing by the side of Guatemoc at the foot of the shaft, round which, as I saw by the light of the torch he carried, an edging of dried bricks was built up to the height of a man above our heads. Resting on this edging, and against the wall of the shaft was a massive block of stone sculptured with the picture-writing of the Aztecs. I glanced at the writing, which I could now read well, and saw that it recorded the burying of the treasure in the last year of Quitloha, Emperor of Mexico, and also a most fearful curse on him who should dare to steal it. Beyond us, and at right angles to the shaft, ran another passage, ten paces in length, and high enough for a man to walk in, which led to a chamber hollowed in the earth as large as that wherein I write to-day at Ditchingham. By the mouth of this chamber were placed piles of adobe bricks and mortar. 
much as the blocks of hewn stone had been placed in the underground vault at Seville, where Isabel de Seguenza was bricked up living. "'Who dug this place?' I asked. "'Those who knew not what they dug,' answered Guatemoc. "'But see, here is our companion. Now, my brother, I charge you be surprised at nothing which comes to pass, and be assured I have good reason for anything that I may do. Before I could speak again the Aztec noble was at our side. Then those above began to lower their jars and sacks of treasure, and as they reached us one by one, Guatemoc loosed the ropes and checked them, while the Aztec and I rolled them down the passage into the chamber as here in England men roll casks of ale. For two hours or more we worked, till at length all were down and the tale was complete. The last parcel to be lowered was a sack of jewels that burst open as it came, and descended upon us as in glittering rain of gems. As it chanced, a great necklace of emeralds of surpassing size and beauty fell over my head, and hung upon my shoulders. <laughs> Keep it, brother, laughed Guatemoc, in memory of this night, and nothing loath, I hid the bauble in my breast. That necklace I have yet, and it was a stone of it, the smallest save one, that I gave to our gracious Queen Elizabeth. Otomie wore it for many years, and for this reason it shall be buried with me. Though its value is priceless, or so say those who are skilled in gems, but priceless or no, it is doomed to lie in the mould of Ditchingham churchyard, and may that same curse which is graved upon the stone that hides the treasure of the Aztecs fall upon him who steals it from my bones. Now, leaving the chamber, we three entered the tunnel and began the work of building the adobe wall. When it was a height of between two and three feet, Guatemoc paused from his labour and bade me hold a torch aloft. I obeyed, wondering what he wished to see. Then he drew back some three paces into the tunnel and spoke to the Aztec noble, our companion, by name. "'What is the fate of discovered traitors, friend?' he said in a voice that, quiet though it was, sounded very terrible, and, as he spoke, he loosed from his side the war-club set with spikes of glass that hung there by a thong. Now the Aztec turned grey beneath his dusky skin, and trembled in his fear. "'What mean you, Lord?' he gasped. "'You know well what I mean,' answered Guatemoc in that same terrible voice, and lifted the club. Then the doomed man fell upon his knees, crying for mercy, and his wailing sounded so awful in that deep and lonely place, that in my horror I went near to letting the torch fall. To a foe I can give mercy, to a traitor none, answered Guatemoc, and whirling the club aloft he rushed upon the noble and killed him with a blow. Then, seizing the body in his strong embrace, he cast it into the chamber with the treasure, and there it lay still and dreadful among the gems and gold, the arms, as it chanced, being wound about two of the great jars, as though the dead man would clasp them to his heart. Now I looked at Guatemoc, who had slain him, wondering if my hour was also at hand for I knew well that when princes bury their wealth they hold that few should share the secret. Oh, fear not, brother, said Guatemoc. Listen, this man was a thief, a dastard, and a traitor. As we know now, he strove twice to betray us to the Jules. More, it was his plan to show his nest of wealth to them, should they return, and to share the spoil. All this we learned from a woman whom he thought his love, but who was in truth a spy, set to worm herself into the secrets of his wicked heart. Now let him take his fill of gold. Look how he grips it, even in death, 
a white man could not hug the stuff more closely to his breast. Ah, Tule, would that the soil of Anahuac bore naught but corn for bread and flint and copper for the points of spears and arrows. Then had her sons been free for ever. Curses on yonder dross, for it is the bait that sets the sea-sharks tearing at our throats. Curse on it, I say, may it never glitter more in the sunshine, may it be lost for ever. And he fell fiercely to the work of building up the wall. Soon it was almost done. But before we set the last bricks, which were shaped in squares like the clay lump that we use for the building of farmeries and hinds across the houses of Norfolk, I thrust a torch through the opening, and looked for the last time at the treasure chamber, that was also a dead house. There lay the glittering gems, there stood upon a jar, gleamed the golden head of Montezuma, of which the emerald eyes seemed to glare at me, and there, his back resting against the same jar, and his arms encircling two others, to the right and to the left, was the dead man but he was no longer dead, or so it seemed to me, for at the least his eyes that were shut had opened, and they stared at me like the emerald eyes of the golden statue above him, only more fearfully. Very hastily I withdrew the torch, and we finished in silence. When it was done we withdrew to the end of the passage, and looked up the shaft and I for one was glad to see the stars shining in the heaven above me. Then we made a double loop in the rope, and at a signal were hauled up till we hung over the ledge where the black mass of marble rested, the tombstone of Montezuma's treasure, and of him who sleeps among it. This stone, that was nicely balanced, we pushed with our hands and feet, till presently it fell forward with a heavy sound, and catching on a ridge of brick which had been prepared to receive it, shut the treasure shaft in such a fashion that those who would enter it again must take powder with them. Then we were dragged up and came to the surface of the earth in safety. Now one asked of the Aztec noble who had gone down with us and returned no more. He has chosen to stay and watch the treasure like a good and loyal man, till such a time as his king needs it, answered Guatemoc grimly, and the listeners nodded, understanding all. Then they fell to, and filled up the narrow shaft with the earth that lay ready, working without cease, and the dawn broke before the task was finished. When at length the hole was full, one of our companions took seeds from a bag, and scattered them upon the naked earth. Also he set two young trees that he had brought with him, in the soil of the shaft, though why he did this I do not know, unless it was to mark the spot. All being done, we gathered up the ropes and tools, and embarking in our canoes, came back to Mexico in the morning leaving the canoes at a landing-place outside the city, and finding our way homes by ones and twos, as we thought unnoticed by any. Thus it was I helped in burying of Montezuma's treasure, for the sake of which I was destined to suffer torture in days to come. Whether any will help to unbury it I do not know, but till I left the land of the Anahuac the secret had been kept, and I think that then, except myself, all those were dead who laboured with me at this task. It chanced that I passed the spot as I came down to Mexico for the last time, and knew it again by the two trees that were growing tall and strong, and as I went by with the Spaniards at my side, I swore in my heart that they should never finger the gold by my help. It is for this reason that even now I do not write the exact bearings of the place where it lies buried, with the bones of the traitor, though I know them well enough, 
seeing that in days to come what I set down here might fall into the hands of one of their nation. And now, before I go on to speak of the siege of Mexico, I must tell of one more matter, namely of how I and Otomie, my wife, went up among the people of the Otomie, and won a great number of them back to their allegiance of the Aztec crown. It must be known, if my tale has not made this clear already, that the Aztec power was not of one people, but built up of several, and that surrounding it were many other tribes, some of whom were in alliance with it, or subject to it, and some of whom were its deadly enemies. Such, for instance, were the Tlascans, a small but warlike people living between Mexico and the coast, by whose help Cortes overcame Montezuma and Guatemoc. Beyond the Tlascans, and to the west, the great Otomie race lived, or lives amongst its mountains. They are a braver nation than the Aztecs, speaking another language, of a different blood, and made up of different clans. Sometimes they were subject to the great Aztec Empire, sometimes in alliance, and sometimes had open war with it and in close friendship with the Tlascans. It was to draw the tie closer between the Aztecs and the Ottomies, who were to the inhabitants of Anahuac much what the Scottish clans are to the people of England, that Montezuma took to wife the daughter and sole legitimate issue of that great chief or king. This lady died in childbirth, and her child was Otomie, my wife, hereditary princess of the Otomie. But though her rank was so great among her mother's people, as yet Otomie had visited them but twice, and then as a child. Still she was well skilled in their language and customs, having been brought up by nurses and tutors of the tribes from which she drew a great revenue every year, and over whom she exercised many rights of royalty, that were rendered to her far more freely than they had been to Montezuma, her father. Now, as has been said, some of these Ottomie clans had joined the Tlascans, and as their allies had taken part in the war on the side of the Spaniards, therefore it was decided at a solemn council that Ottomie and I, her husband, should go on an embassy to the chief town of the nation that was known as the City of Pines, and strive to win it back to the Aztec standard. Accordingly, heralds having been sent before us, we started upon our journey, not knowing how we should be received at the end of it. For eight days we travelled in great pomp and with an ever-increasing escort. But when the tribes of the Ottomie learned that their princess was to come to visit them in person, bringing with her her husband, a man of the Teules who had espoused the Aztec cause, they flocked in vast numbers to swell her retinue, so that it came to pass that before we reached the city of Pines we were accompanied by an army of at least ten thousand mountaineers, great men and wild, who made a savage music as we marched but with them and with their chiefs as yet we held no converse except by way of formal greeting, though every morning when we started on our journey, Otomie in a litter and I on a horse that had been captured from the Spaniards, they set up shouts of salutation and made the mountains ring. Ever as we went, the land like its people grew wilder and more beautiful, for now we were passing through forests clad with oak and pine, and with many a lovely plant and fern. Sometimes we crossed great and sparkling rivers, and sometimes wended through the gorges and passes of the mountains. But every hour we mounted higher, till at length the climate became like that of England, only far more bright. At last, on the eighth day, we passed through the gorge given in the red rock, which was so narrow in places that three horsemen could scarcely have ridden there abreast. This gorge, that is five miles long, is the high road to the City of Pines, to which there was no other access except by secret paths across the mountains, 
and on the other side of it sheer and towering cliffs that rise to heights of between one and two thousand feet. "'Here is a place where a hundred men might hold an army at bay,' I said to Otomie, little knowing that it would be my task to do so in a day to come. Presently the gorge took a turn, and I reined up amazed, for before me was the City of Pines, in all its beauty. The city lay in a wheel-shaped plain that may measure twelve miles across, and all around this plain are mountains clad to their summits with forests of oak and cedar trees. At the back of the city, and in the centre of the ring of mountains, is one, however, that is not green with foliage, but black with lava, and above the lava white with snow, over which again hangs a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. This was the Vulcan Jaca, or the Queen, and though it is not so lofty as its sister Orizaba, Popo, and Ishtak, to my mind it is the loveliest of them all both because of its perfect shape, and of the colours purple and blue, of the fires that it sends forth at night, or when its heart is troubled. The Ottomies worshipped this mountain as a god, offering human sacrifice to it, which was not wonderful. For once the lava pouring from its bowels cut a path through the city of pines. Also they think it holy and haunted, so that none dares set foot upon its loftier snows. Nevertheless, I was destined to climb them, I and one other. Now in the lap of this ring of mountains, and watched over by the mighty Xhaka, clad in its robe of snow, its cap of smoke, and its crown of fire, lies, or rather lay, the city of pines, for now it is a ruin, or so I left it. As to the city itself, it was not so large as some others that I have seen in Anahuac, having only a population of some five and thirty thousand souls, since the Otomi, being a race of mountaineers, did not desire to dwell in cities. But if it was not great, it was the most beautiful of Indian towns being laid out in straight streets that met at a square in its centre. All along these streets were houses, each standing in a garden, and for the most part built of blocks of lava and roofed with a cement of white lime. In the midst of the square stood the Teocli, or Pyramid of Worship, crowned with temples that were garnished with ropes of skulls, while beyond the pyramid and facing it was the palace, the home of Otomie's forefathers, a long, low, and very ancient building having many courts, and sculptured everywhere with snakes and grinning gods. Both the palace and the pyramid were cased with fine white stone that shone like silver in the moonlight, and contrasted strangely with the dark-hued houses that were built of lava. Such was the City of Pines when I saw it first. When I saw it last, it was but a smoking ruin, and now doubtless it is the home of bats and jackals. Now it is a court for owls, now the line of confusion is stretched out upon it, and the stones of emptiness fill its streets. Passing from the mouth of the gorge, we travel some miles across the plain, every foot of which was cultivated with corn, magui or aloe, and other crops, till we came to one of the four gates of the city. Entering we found the flat roofs on either side of the wide street, crowded with hundreds of women and children, who threw flowers on us as we passed, and cried, Welcome, Princess! Welcome, Otomy, Princess of the Otomy! And when at length we reached the great square, it seemed as though all the men in Anahuac were gathered there, and they too took up the cry of, Welcome, Otomie, Princess of the Otomie. 
till the earth shook with the sound. Me also they saluted as I passed, by touching the earth with their right hand, and then holding the hand above their head. But I think that the horse I rode caused them more wonder than I did, for the most of them had never seen a horse, and looked on it as a monster or a demon. So we went on through the shouting mass, followed and preceded by thousands of warriors, many of them decked in glittering feather mail, and bearing broidered banners, till we had passed the pyramid, where I saw the priests at their cruel work above us, and were come to the palace gates. And here, in a strange chamber, sculptured with grinning demons, we found our rest for a while. On the morrow in the great hall of the palace was held a council of the chiefs and headman of the Ottomie clans, to the number of a hundred or more. When all were gathered, dressed as an Aztec noble on the first rank, I came out with Otomi, who wore royal robes and looked most beautiful in them, and the council rose to greet us. Otomi bade them be seated, and addressed them thus. Hear me, you chiefs and captains of my mother's race, who am your princess by right of blood, the last of your ancient rulers, and who am, moreover, the daughter of Montezuma, emperor of Anhuac, now dead to us, but living evermore in the mansions of the sun. First, I present to you this my husband, the Lord Tew, to whom I was given in marriage when he held the spirit of the god Tescat, and whom, when he had passed the altar of the god, being chosen by heaven to aid us in our war, I wedded anew after the fashion of the earth, and by the will of my royal brethren. Know, chiefs and captains, that this lord, my husband, is not of our Indian blood, nor is he altogether of the blood of the Tules, with whom we are at war, but rather that of the true children of Quetzal, the dwellers in a far-off northern sea, who are foes to the Tules. And as they are foes, so this, my lord, is their foe. And as doubtless you have heard, of all the deeds of arms that were wrought upon the night of the slaying of the Tules, none were greater than his. And it was he who first discovered their retreat. Chiefs and captains of the great and ancient people of the Otomie, I, your princess, have been sent to you by Quitlahoa, my king and yours, together with my lord, to plead with you on a certain matter. Our king has heard, and I also have heard with shame, that many of the warriors of our blood have joined the Tlascans, who were ever foes to the Aztecs, in their unholy alliance with the Tules. Now for a while the white men are beaten back, but they have touched the gold they covet, and they will return again like bees to a half-drained flower. They will return, yet of themselves they can do nothing against the glory of Tenochtitlan. But how shall it go if with them come thousands and tens of thousands of the Indian people? I know well that now in this time of trouble, when kingdoms crumble, when the air is full of portents, and the very gods seem impotent, there are many who would seize this moment and turn it to their profit. There are many men and tribes who remember ancient wars and wrongs, who cry, Now is the hour of vengeance, now we will think on the widows that the Aztec spears have made on the tribute which they have wrung from our poverty to swell their wealth, and on the captives who have decked the altars of their sacrifice. Is it not so? Aye, it is so, and I cannot wonder at it. 
Yet I ask you to remember this, that the yoke you would help to set upon the neck of the Queen of Cities will fit your neck also. O oh, foolish men, do you think that you shall be spared when by your aid Tenochtitlan is a ruin and the Aztecs are no more a people? I say to you, never. The sticks that the Teules use to beat out the life of Tenochtitlan shall by them be broken one by one and cast into the fire to burn. If the Aztecs fall, then early or late every tribe within this wide land shall fall. They shall be slain, their cities shall be stamped flat, their wealth shall be wrung from them, and their children shall eat the bread of slavery and drink the water of affliction. Choose, ye people of the Otomie. Will you stand by the men of your own customs and country, though they have been your foes at times, or will you throw in your lot with this stranger? Choose, ye people of the Otomie. Will you stand by men of your own customs and country, though they have been your foes at times, or will you throw in your lot with the stranger? Choose, ye people of the Otomie, and know this, that on your choice and that of the other men of Anahuac depends the fate of Anahuac. I am your princess, and you should obey me. But today I issue no command. I say, choose between the alliance of the Aztecs and the Oak of the Tule. And may the God above the gods, the Almighty, the Invisible God, direct your choice. Artemy ceased, and a murmur of applause went round the hall. Alas, I can do no justice to the fire of her words, any more than I can describe the dignity and loveliness of her person as it seemed in that hour. But they went to the hearts of the rude chieftains who listened. Many of them despised the Aztecs as a womanish people of the plains and the lakes, a people of commerce. Many had blood feuds against them, dating back for generations, but still they knew that their princess spoke truth, and that the triumph of the Teule in Tenochtitlan would mean his triumph over every city throughout the land. So then and there they chose, though in after days, in the stress of defeat and trouble, many went back upon their choice, as is the fashion of men. Hot me, cried their spokesman, after they had taken counsel together. We have chosen. Princess, your words have conquered us. We throw in our lot with the Aztecs, and will fight to the last for freedom from the Teule. Now I see that you are indeed my people, and I am indeed your ruler, answered Otomy. So the great lords who are gone, my forefathers, your chieftains, would have spoken in a like case. May you never regret this choice, my brethren, men of Otomy. And so it came to pass that when we left the city of Pines, we took to Quitlahoa, the emperor, a promise of an army of twenty thousand men, vowed to serve him to their death in his war against the Spaniard. End of chapter 25 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 26 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 26 The Crowning of Guatemoc. 
Our business with the people of the Otomi being ended for a while, we returned to the city of Tenochtitlan, which we reached safely, having been absent a month and a day. It was but a little time, and yet long enough for fresh sorrows to have fallen on that most unhappy town. For now the Almighty had added to the burdens which were laid upon her. She had tasted death by the sword of the white man, now death was with her in another shape. For the Spaniard had brought the foul sickness of Europe with him, and smallpox raged throughout the land. Day by day thousands perished of it, for these ignorant people treated the plague by pouring cold water upon the bodies of those smitten, driving the fever inwards to the vitals, so that within two days most of them died. It was pitiful to see them maddened with suffering as they wandered to and fro about the streets, spreading the distemper far and wide. They were dying in the houses. They lay dead by companies in the market-places awaiting burial, for the sickness took its toll of every family. The very priests were smitten by it at the altars, as they sacrificed children to appease the anger of the gods. But the worst is still to tell. Quitloa, the emperor, was struck down by the illness, and when we reached the city he lay dying. Still, he desired to see us, and sent commands that we should be brought to his bedside. In vain did I pray Otomi not to obey. She who was without fear laughed at me, saying, What, my husband, shall I shrink from that which you must face? Come, let us go and make report of our mission. If the sickness takes me, and I die, it will be because my hour has come. So we went, and were ushered into the chamber where Quitloa lay covered by a sheet, as though he were already dead, and with incense burning round him in golden censers. When we entered he was in a stupor, but presently he awoke, and it was announced to him that we waited. A "'Welcome, my niece,' he said speaking through the sheet and in a very thick voice. You find me in an evil case, for my days are numbered. A pestilence of the Teule slays those whom their swords spared. Soon another monarch must take my throne, as I took your father's, and uh, I do not altogether grieve, for on him will rest the glory and the burden of the last fight of the Aztecs. Your report, niece, let me hear it swiftly. What say the clans of the Otomi, your vassals? My lord, Otomi answered, speaking humbly and with bowed head, May this distemper leave you, and may you live to reign over us for many years. My lord, my husband Teule and I have won back the most part of the people of the Otomi to our cause and standard. An army of twenty thousand mountain men waits upon your word, and when those are spent there are more to follow. Oh, well done, daughter of Montezuma! "'And you, white man,' gasped the dying king. "'The gods were wise when they refused you both upon this stone sacrifice, "'and I was foolish when I would have slain you, Tule. "'To you and all, I say be steadfast of heart, "'and if you must die, then die with honour. Oh, the fray draws on, but I shall not share it, and who knows its end? Now we lay silent for a while, 
Then of a sudden, as though an inspiration had seized him, he cast the sheets from his face and sat upon his couch. No pleasant sight to see, for the pestilence had done its worst with him. Alas! he wailed, and alas! I see the streets of Tenochtitlan red with blood and fire. I see her dead piled up in heaps, and the horses of the Teules trample them. I see the spirit of my people, and her voice is sighing, and her neck is heavy with chains. The children are visited because the evil of the fathers. Ye are doomed, people of Anahuac, whom I have nurtured as an eagle nurtures her young. Hell yawns for you, and earth refuses you because of your sins. And the remnant that remains shall be slaves, from generation to generation, till the vengeance is accomplished. Having cried thus with a great voice, Quitloa fell back upon the cushions, and before the frightened leech who tended him could lift his head, he had passed beyond the troubles of this earth. But the words which he had spoken remained fixed in the hearts of those who heard them, though they were told to none except Guatemoc. Thus then in my presence, and in that of Otomi, died Quitloa, emperor of the Aztecs, when he had reigned but fifteen weeks. Once more the nation mourned its king, the chief of many a thousand of its children, whom the pestilence swept with him to the mansions of the sun, or perchance to the darkness behind the stars. But the mourning was not for long, for in the urgency of the times it was necessary that a new emperor should be crowned to take command of the armies and rule the nation. Therefore, on the morrow of the burial of Quitloa, the council of the four electors was convened, and with them lesser nobles and princes to the number of three hundred, and I among them in the right of my rank as general, and as the husband of a Princess Otomie. There was no need for great deliberation. Indeed, for though the names of several were mentioned, the princes knew that there was but one man who by birth by courage and nobility of mind, was fitted to cope with the troubles of the nation. And that man was Guatemoc, my friend and blood-brother, the nephew of the two last emperors, and the husband of my wife's sister, Montezuma's daughter, Tequichpo. All I knew, I say, except strangely enough, Guatemoc himself, for as he passed into the chamber he named two other princes, saying that without doubt the choice lay between them. Oh, it was a splendid and solemn sight, that gathering of the four great lords, the electors, dressed in their magnificent robes, and of the lesser council of confirmation of three hundred lords and princes, who sat without the circle but in hearing of all that passed. Very solemn also was the prayer of the high priest, who, clad in his robes of sable, seemed like a blot of ink dropped on a glitter of gold. And thus he prayed, O God, Thou who art everywhere and seest all, knowest that Quitloha, our king, is gathered to Thee. Thou hast set him beneath the footstool, and there he rests in his rest. He has travelled that road which we must travel every one. He has reached the royal inhabitations of our dead, the home of everlasting shadows. There, where none shall trouble him, he is sunk in sleep. His brief labours are accomplished, and soiled with sin and sorrow he has gone to thee. Thou gavest him joys to taste, but not to drink. The glory of empire passed before his eyes, like the madness of a dream. 
with tears and with prayers to thee he took up his load with happiness he laid it down where his forefathers went thither he has followed nor can he return to us our fire is an ash and our lamp is darkness those who wore his purple before him bequeathed to him the intolerable weight of rule and he in his turn bequeaths it to another truly he should give thee praise thou king of wars master of the stars that standest alone who has lifted from his shoulders so great a burden and from his brow this crown of woes paying him peace for war and rest for labour o god our hope choose now a servant to succeed him a man after thine own heart who shall not fear nor falter who shall toil and not be weary who shall lead thy people as a mother leads her children lord of lords give grace to guatemoc thy creature who is our choice seal him to thy service and as thy priest let him sit upon thy earthly throne for his life days let thy foes become his footstool let him exalt thy glory proclaim thy worship and protect thy kingdom thus have i prayed to thee in the name of the nation o god thy will be done when the high priest had made an end to his prayer the first of the four great electors rose saying guatemoc in the name of god and with the voice of the people of anahuac we summon you to the throne of anahuac long may you live and justly may you rule and may the glory be yours of beating back into the sea those foes who would destroy us hail to you guatemoc emperor of the aztecs and of their vassal tribes and all the three hundred of the council of confirmation repeated in a voice of thunder hail to you guatemoc emperor now the prince himself stood forward and spoke you lords of election and you princes generals nobles and captains of the council of confirmation hear me may the gods be my witness that when i entered this place i had no thought or knowledge that i was destined to so high an honour as that which you would thrust upon me and may the gods be my witness again that were my life my own and not a trust in the hands of the people i would say to you seek on and find one worthier to fill the throne but my life is not my own anahuac calls her son and i will obey the call war to the death threatens her and shall i hang back while my arm has strength to smite and my brain has power to plan not so now and henceforth i vow myself to the service of my country and to the war against the tules i will make no peace with them i will take no rest till they are driven back whence they came or till i am dead beneath their swords none can say what the gods have in store for us it may be victory or it may be destruction but be it triumph or death let us swear a great oath together my people and my brethren let us swear to fight the tules and the traitors who abet them for our cities our hearths and our altars till the cities are a smoking ruin till the hearths are cumbered with their dead and the altars run red with the blood of their worshippers so if we are destined to conquer our triumph shall be made sure and if we are doomed to fail at least there will be a story to be told of us do you swear my people and my brethren 
"'We swear,' they answered with a shout. "'It is well,' said Guatemoc. "'And now may everlasting shame overtake him who breaks this oath.' Thus then was Guatemoc, the last and greatest of the Aztec emperors, elected to the throne of his forefathers. It was happy for him that he could not foresee that dreadful day when he, the noblest of men, must meet a felon's doom at the hand of these very Teules. Yet so it came about, for the destiny that lay upon the land smote all alike. Indeed, the greater the man, the more certain was his fate. When all was done, I hurried to the palace to tell Otomie what had come to pass, and found her in our sleeping chamber, lying on her bed. "'What ails you, Otomie?' I asked. "'Alas, my husband,' she answered, "'the pestilence has stricken me. "'Come not near, I pray you, come not near. "'Let me be nursed by women. "'You shall not risk your life for me, beloved.' "'Peace,' I said, and came to her. "'It was too true. "'I, who am a physician, knew the symptoms well.' Indeed, had it not been for my skill, Otomie would have died. For three long weeks I fought with death at her bedside, and in the end I conquered. The fever left her, and thanks to my treatment there was no single scar upon her lovely face. During the eight days her mind wandered without ceasing, and it was then I learned how deep and perfect was her love for me. For all this while she did nothing but rave of me, and the secret terror of her heart was disclosed, that I should cease to care for her, that her beauty and love might pall upon me, so that I should leave her, that the flower-maid, for so she named Lily, who dwelt across the sea, should draw me back to her by magic. This was the burden of her madness. At length, her senses returned, and she spoke, saying, "'How long have I been ill, husband?' I told her, and she said, "'And have you nursed me all this while, and through so foul a sickness?' "'Yes, Artemie, I have tended you.' "'What have I done that you should be so good to me?' she murmured. Then some dreadful thought seemed to strike her, for she moaned as though in pain, and said, a mirror! Swift, bring me a mirror! I gave her one, and raising on her arm, eagerly she scanned her face in the dim light of the shadowed room, then let the plate of burnished gold fall, and sank back with a faint and happy cry. I feared, she said, I feared that I had become hideous as those whom the pestilence has smitten, and that you would cease to love me than which it had been better to die. For shame, I said, do you think that love can be frightened away by a few scars? Yes, Artemie answered, that is the love of a man, not such love as mine, husband. Had I been thus, oh, I shudder to think of it. Within a year you would have hated me, Perhaps it would have not been so with another, the fair maid of far away, but me you would have hated. Nay, I know it, though I know this also, that I should not have lived to feel your hate. Oh, I am thankful, thankful! Then I left her for a while, marvelling at the great love which she had given me and wondering also if there was any truth in her words, and if the heart of man could be so ungrateful and so vile. Supposing that Artemy was now, as many were, who walked the streets of Tenochtitlan that day, a mass of dreadful scars, hairless, and with blind and whitened eyeballs, should I then have shrunk from her? I do not know and I thank heaven that no such trial was put upon my constancy. But I am sure of this, 
Had I become a leper even, Otomie would not have shrunk from me. So Otomie recovered from her great sickness, and shortly afterwards the pestilence passed away from Tenochtitlan, and now I had many other things to think of, for the choosing of Guatemoc, my friend and blood-brother, as emperor, meant much advancement to me, who was made a general of the highest class, and a principal adviser of his councils. Nor did I spare himself in his service, but I laboured day and night in the work of preparing the city for siege, and in the marshalling of the troops, and more especially of that army of Otomies, who came, as they had promised, to the number of twenty thousand. The work was hard indeed, for these Indian tribes lacked discipline and powers of unity, without which their thousands were of little avail in a war with white men. Also there were great jealousies between their leaders, which must be overcome, and I was myself an object of jealousy. Moreover, many tribes took this occasion of the trouble of the Aztecs to throw off their allegiances or vassalage, and even if they did not join the Spaniards, to remain neutral watching for the event of the war. Still we laboured on, dividing the armies into regiments after the fashion of Europe, and stationing each in its own quarters, drilling them to the better use of arms, provisioning the city for a siege, and weeding out as many useless mouths as we might. And there was but one man in Tenochtitlan who toiled at these more heavily than I, and that was Guatemoc the Emperor, who did not rest day or night. I tried even to make powder with sulphur, which was brought from the throat of the Vulcan Popo, but not having the knowledge of that art, I failed. Indeed, it would have availed as little had I succeeded, for having neither arquebuses nor cannons, and no skill to cast them, we could have only used it in mining roads and gateways, and perhaps in grenades to be thrown with the hand. And so the months went on, till at length spies came in with the tidings that the Spaniards were advancing in numbers, and with them countless hosts of allies. Now I would have sent Otomie to seek safety among her own people, but she laughed at me to scorn, and said, Where you are, there I will be, husband. What, shall it be suffered that you face death, perhaps to find him, when I am not at your side to die with you? If that is the fashion of white women, I leave it to them, beloved, and here with you I stay. End of chapter 26 Recording by Patrick 79「Chapter twenty seven of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter twenty seven. The Fall of Tenochtitlan. Now, shortly after Christmas, having marched from the coast with a great array of Spaniards, from many had joined his banner from over sea and tens of thousands of native allies, Cortes took up his headquarters at Tezcucu, in the valley of Mexico. This town is situated near the borders of the lake, at a distance of several miles from Tenochtitlan, and being on the edge of the territory of Tlaxcans, his allies, it was most suitable to Cortes as a base of action. And then began one of the most terrible wars that the world has seen, for eight months it raged, and when it ceased at length, Tenochtitlan, and with many of its other beautiful and populous towns, were blackened ruins. The most of the Aztecs were dead by sword and famine, and their nation was crushed for ever. Of all the details of this war I do not purpose to write, for were I to do so there would be no end to this book, and I have my own tale to tell. These, therefore, I leave to the makers of histories. 
let it be enough to say that the plan of Cortes was to destroy all her vassal and allied cities and peoples before he grappled with Mexico, queen of the valley, and this he set himself to do with a skill, a valour, and a straightness of purpose, such as have scarcely been shown by any general since the days of Caesar. Ishtapalapan was the first to fall, and here ten thousand men, women, and children were put to the sword, or burned alive. Then came the turn of the others. One by one, Cortes reduced the cities until the whole girdle of them was in his hand, and Tenochtitlan alone remained untouched. Many indeed surrendered, for the nations of Anahuac, being of various blood, were but as a bundle of reeds, and not as a tree. Thus when the power of Spain cut the band of empire that bound them together, they fell this way and that, having no unity. So it came about that as the power of Guatemoc weakened, that of Cortes increased, for he garnered these loosened reeds into his basket. And indeed, now that the people saw that Mexico had met her match, many an ancient hate and smouldering rivalry broke into flame and they fell upon her and tore her, like half-tamed wolves upon the master when his scourge is broken. It was this that brought about the fall of Anahuac. Had she remained true to herself, had she forgotten her feuds and jealousies, and stood against the Spaniards as one man, then Tenochtitlan would never have fallen, and Cortes, with every tool in his company, had been stretched upon the stone of sacrifice. Did I not say when I took up my pen to write this book that every wrong revenges itself at last upon the man or the people that wrought it? So it was now. Mexico was destroyed because of the abomination of the worship of her gods. These feuds between the allied people had their root in the horrible rites of human sacrifice. At some time in the past, from all these cities, captives have been dragged to the altars of the gods of Mexico, there to be slaughtered and devoured by the cannibal worshippers. Now these outrages were remembered. Now, when the arm of the queen of the valley was withered, the children of those whom she had slain rose up to slay her and to drag her children to the altars. By the end of May, strive as we would, and never was a more gallant fight made, all our allies were crushed or had deserted us, and the siege of the city began. It began by land and by water, for with incredible resource Cortes caused thirteen brigantines of war to be constructed in Tlaxcala, and conveyed in pieces for twenty leagues across the mountains to his camp, whence they were floated into the lake through a canal, which was hollowed out by the labour of ten thousand Indians, who worked at it without cease for two months. The bearers of these brigantines were escorted by an army of twenty thousand Tlascans, and if I could have had my way, that army should have been attacked in the mountain passes. So thought Guatemoc also, but there were few troops to spare for the most of our force had been dispatched to threaten a city named Chalco, that though its people were of the Aztec blood, had not been ashamed to desert the Aztec cause. Still, I offered to lead the twenty thousand Ottomies whom I commanded against the Tlascan convoy, and the matter was debated hotly at a council of war. But the most of the council were against the risking of an engagement with the Spaniards and their allies so far from the city and thus the opportunity went by to return no more. It was an evil fortune like the rest, for in the end these brigantines brought about the fall of Tenochtitlan by cutting off the food supply, which was carried by canoes across the lake. Alas, the bravest can do nothing against the power of famine. Hunger is a very great man, as the Indians say. Now the Aztecs, fighting alone, were face to face with their foes, and the last struggle began, 
First the Spaniards cut the aqueduct which supplied the city with water from the springs at the royal house of Chapultepec, whither I was taken on being brought to Mexico. Henceforth, till the end of the siege, the only water we found to drink was a brackish and muddy water furnished by the lake and wells sunk in the soil. Although it might be drunk after boiling to free it of the salt, it was unwholesome and filthy to the taste, breeding various painful sicknesses and fevers. It was on this day of the cutting of the aqueduct that Otomie bore me a son, our firstborn. Already the hardships of the siege were so great and nourishing food so scarce, that had she been less strong, or had I possessed less skill in medicine, I think she would have died. Still she recovered to my great thankfulness and joy, and though I am no clerk, I baptized a boy into the Christian church with my own hand, naming him Thomas after me. Now day by day and week by week the fighting went on with varying success, sometimes in the suburbs of the city, sometimes on the lake, and sometimes in the very streets. Time on time the Spaniards were driven back with loss, time on time they advanced again from different camps. Once we captured sixty of them, and more than a thousand of their allies. All of these were sacrificed on the altar of Witzel, and given over to be devoured by the Aztecs, according to the beast-like custom which in Anahuac enjoyed the eating of the bodies of those who were offered to the gods, not because the Indians love such meat, but for a secret religious reason. In vain I did pray Guatemoc to forego this horror. Is this time for gentleness? he answered fiercely. I cannot save them from the altar, and I would not if I could. Let the dogs die, according to the custom of the land. And to you, Teul, my brother, I say, presume not too far. Alas, the heart of Guatemoc grew ever fiercer as the struggle wore on, and indeed it was little to be wondered at. This was the dreadful plan of Cortes, to destroy the city piecemeal as he advanced towards its heart, and it was carried out without mercy. So soon as the Spaniards got footing in a quarter, thousands of Tlascans were set to work to fire the houses, and burn all in them alive. Before the siege was done, Tenochtitlan, queen of the valley, was but a heap of blackened ruins. Cortes might have cried over Mexico with Isaiah the prophet, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? In all these fights I took my part, though it does not become me to boast my prowess. Still the Spaniards knew me well, and they had good reason. Whenever they saw me, they would greet me with revelings, calling me traitor and renegade, and Guatemoc's white dog, and, moreover, Cortes set a price upon my head. For he knew through his spies that some of Guatemoc's most successful attacks and stratagems had been of my devising. But I took no heed even when their insults pierced me like arrows. For though many of the Aztecs were my friends, and I hated the Spaniards, it was a shameful thing that a Christian man should be warring on the side of cannibals who made human sacrifice. I took no heed, since always I was seeking for my foe de Garcia. He was there, I knew, for I saw him many times, but I never could come at him. Indeed, if I watch for him, he also watch for me, but with another purpose, to avoid me. For now, as of old, de Garcia feared me. Now, as of old, he believed that I should bring his death upon him. 
it was the custom of warriors in the opposing armies to send challengers to single combat one to another and many such duels were fought in the sight of all safe conduct being given to the combatants and their seconds upon a day despairing to meet him face to face in battle i sent a challenge to de garcia by a herald under his false name of sarcada in an hour the herald returned with his message written on paper in spanish christian men do not fight duels with renegade heathen dogs white worshippers of devils and eaters of human flesh there is but one weapon which such cannot devile a rope and it waits for you thomas wingfield i tore the writing to pieces and stamped upon it in my rage for now to all his other crimes against me de garcia had added the blackest insult but wrath availed me nothing for i could never come near him though once with ten of my otomies i charged into the heart of the spanish column after him from that rush i alone escaped alive the ten otomies were sacrificed to my hate how shall i paint the horrors that day by day were heaped upon the doomed city soon all the food was gone and men ay and worse still tender women and children must eat such meat as swine would have turned from striving to keep life in them for a little longer grass the bark of trees slugs and insects washed down with brackish water from the lake these were their best food these and the flesh of captives offered in sacrifice now they began to die by hundreds and by thousands they died so fast that none could bury them where they perished there they lay till at length their bodies bred a plague a black and horrible fever that swept off thousands more who in turn became the root of pestilence for one who was killed by the spaniards and their allies two were swept off by hunger and plague think then what was the number of dead when not less than seventy thousand perished beneath the sword and fire alone indeed it is said that forty thousand died in this manner in a single day the night before the last of the siege one night i came back to the lodgings where otomie dwelt with her sister tequichpo the wife of guatemoc for now all the palaces had been burnt down i was starving for i had scarcely tasted food for forty hours but all that my wife could set before me were three little meal cakes or tortillas mixed with bark she kissed me and bade me eat them but i discovered that she herself had touched no food that day so i would not till she had shared them then i noted that she could scarcely swallow the bitter morsels and also that she strove to hide tears which ran down her face what is it wife i asked then otomie broke out into a great and bitter crying and said this my beloved for two days the milk has been dry in my breast hunger has dried it and our babe is dead look he lies dead and she drew aside a cloth and showed me his tiny body hush i said he is spared much can we then desire that a child should live to see such days as we have seen and after all to die at last he was our son our first-born she cried again oh why must we suffer thus we must suffer otomie because we are born to it just so much happiness is given to us as shall save us from madness and no more ask me not why for i cannot answer you there is no answer in my faith 
or in any other. And then, looking on that dead babe, I wept also. Every hour in those terrible months it was my lot to see a thousand sights more awful, and yet this sight of a dead infant moved me the most of all of them. The child was mine, my firstborn. Its mother wept beside me, and its stiff and tiny fingers seemed to drag at my heart-strings. Seek not the cause, for the Almighty, who gave the heart its infinite power of pain, alone can answer, and to our ears he is dumb. Then I took a mattock, and dug a hole outside the house till I came to water, which in Tenochtitlan is found at a depth of about two feet or so, and having muttered a prayer over him, there in the water I laid the body of our child, burying it out of sight. At the least he was not left for the Zapilots, as the Aztecs called the vultures, like the rest of them. After that we wept ourselves to sleep in each other's arms. Otomie, murmuring from time to time, Oh, my husband, I would that we were asleep and forgotten, we and the babe together. Rest now, I answered, for death is very near to us. The morrow came, and with it a deadlier fray than that had gone before, and after it more morrows and more deaths. But still we lived on, for Guatemoc gave us of his food. Then Cortes sent his heralds demanding our surrender, and now three-fourths of the city was in ruin, and three-fourths of its defenders were dead. The dead were heaped in the houses like bees stifled in a hive, and in the streets they lay so thick that we walked on them. The council was summoned, fierce men, haggard with hunger and with war, and they considered the office of Cortes. "'What is your word, Guatemoc? said the spokesman at last. "'Am I Montezuma, that you ask me? "'I swore to defend the city to the last,' he answered hoarsely. "'And for my part I will defend it. "'Better that we should all die than that we should fall living "'into the hands of the Teules.' "'So say we,' they replied, and the war went on. At length there came a day when the Spaniards made a new attack and gained another portion of the city. There the people were huddled together like sheep in a pen. We strove to defend them, but our arms were weak with famine. They fired into us with their pieces, mowing us down like corn before the sickle. Then the Tlascans were loosed upon us, like fierce hounds upon the defenceless buck, and on this day it is said that there died forty thousand people, for none were spared. On the morrow it was the last day of the siege, came a fresh company from Cortes, asking that Guatemoc should meet him. The answer was the same, for nothing could conquer that noble spirit. "'Tell him,' said Guatemoc, "'that I will die where I am, "'but I will hold no parley with him. "'We are helpless. "'Let Cortes work his pleasure on us.' "'By now all the city was destroyed, "'and we who remained alive within its bounds "'were gathered on the causeways "'and behind the ruins of walls, "'men, women, and children together.' Here they attacked us again. The great drum of the Teocalli beat for the last time, and for the last time the wild scream of the Aztec warriors went up to heaven. We fought our best. I killed four men that day with my arrow, which Otomie, who was at my side, 
handed me as I shot. But the most of us had not the strength of a child, and what could we do? They came among us like seamen, among a flock of seals, and slaughtered us by hundreds. They drove us into the canals, and trod us to death there, till bridges were made of our bodies. How we escaped I do not know. At length a party of us, among whom was Guatemoc with his wife Tequichpo, were driven to the shores of the lakes where lay the canoes, and into these we entered, scarcely knowing what we did, but thinking that we might escape, for now all the city was taken. The brigantine saw us, and sailed after us with a favouring wind. The wind always favoured the foe in that war. And row as we would, one of them came up with us, and began to fire into us. Then Guatemoc stood up, and spoke, saying, I am Guatemoc, bring me to Malinche, but spare those of my people who remain alive. Now, I said to Otomie at my side, my hour has come, for the Spaniards will surely hang me, and it is in my mind, wife, that I should do well to kill myself, so that I may be saved from a death of shame. Nay, husband, she answered sadly, as I said in bygone days, while you live there is hope, but the dead come back no more. Fortune may favour us yet. Still, if you think otherwise, I am ready to die. That I will not suffer, Otomie. Then you must hold your hand, husband, for now, as always, where you go, I follow. Listen, I whispered. Do not let it be known that you are my wife. Pass yourself as one of the ladies of Tequichpo, the queen, your sister. If we are separated, and if by chance I escape, I will try to make my way to the city of Pines. There, among your own people, we may find refuge. So be it, beloved, she answered, smiling sadly but I do not know how the Otomi will receive me, who have led twenty thousand of their bravest men to a dreadful death. Now we were on the deck of a brigantine, and must stop talking, and thence, after the Spaniards had quarrelled over us a while, we were taken ashore, and led to the top of a house which still stood, where quarters had made ready hurriedly to receive his royal prisoner. Surrounded by his escort, the Spanish general stood, cap in hand, and by his side was Marina, grown more lovely than before, whom I now met for the first time since we had parted in Tabasco. Our eyes met, and she started, thereby showing that she knew me again, though it must have been hard for Marina to recognize her friend Tule in a blood-stained, starving, and tattered wretch who could scarcely find strength to climb the azotea. But at that time no words passed between us, for all eyes were bent on the meeting between Cortes and Guatemoc, between the conqueror and the conquered. Still proud and defiant, though he seemed but a living skeleton, Guatemoc walked straight to where the Spaniard stood, and spoke. Marina translating his words. I am Guatemoc, the Emperor, Malinche, he said. What a man might do to defend his people, I have done. Look on the fruits of my labour, and he pointed to the blackened ruins of Teneptitlan that stretched on every side as far as the eye could reach. Now I have come to this pass for the gods themselves have been against me. Deal with me as you will, but it will be best that you kill me now. And he touched the dagger of Cortes with his hands, and thus rid me swiftly of the misery of life. Fear not, Guatemoc, answered Cortes. You have fought like a brave man, and such I honour. With me you are safe, 
for we Spaniards love a gallant foe. See here is food, and he pointed to a table spread with such viands as we had not seen for many a week. Eat, you and your companions together, for you must need it. Afterwards we will talk. So we ate, and heartily, I for my part thinking that it would be well to die upon such a full stomach, having faced death so long upon an empty one, and while we devoured the meat the Spaniards stood on one side scanning us, not without pity. Presently Tequichpo was brought before Cortes, and with her Otomie and some six other ladies. He greeted her graciously, and they also were given to eat. Now one of the Spaniards, who had been watching me, whispered something into the ear of Cortes, and I saw his face darken. "'Say,' he said to me in Castilian, "'are you that renegade, that traitor, who has aided these Aztecs against us?' "'I am no renegade and no traitor, General,' I answered boldly, for the food and wine had put new life into me. I am an Englishman, and I have fought with the Aztecs because I have good cause to hate you Spaniards. You shall soon have better, traitor, he said furiously. Here, lead this man away, and hang him on the mast of the yonder ship. Now I saw that it was finished, and made ready to go to my death, when Marina spoke into the ear of Cortes. All she said I could not catch, but I heard the words, Hidden gold. He listened, then hesitated, and spoke aloud. Do not hang this man to-day. Let him be safely guarded. Tomorrow I will inquire into his case. End of chapter 27 Recording by Patrick 79「Thomas is doomed. At the words of Cortes, two Spaniards came forward, and seizing me one by either arm, they led me across the roof of the house towards the stairway. Otomie had heard also, and though she did not understand the words, she read the face of Cortes, and knew well that I was being taken to imprisonment or death. As I passed her, she started forward, a terror shining in her eyes, fearing that she was about to throw herself upon my breast, and thus to reveal herself as my wife, and bring my fate upon her, I glanced at her warningly, then making pretence to stumble, as though with fear and exhaustion, I fell at her feet. The soldiers who led me laughed brutally and one of them kicked me with his heavy boot. But Otomie stooped down and held her hand to me, to help me rise, and as I did so, we spoke low and swiftly. Farewell, wife, I said. Whatever happens, keep silent. Farewell, she answered. If you must die, await me in the gates of death, for I will join you there. Nay, live on, time shall bring comfort. You are my life, beloved. With you time ends for me. Now I was on my feet again, and I think that none noted our whispered words, for all were listening to quarters, who rated the man that had kicked me. I bade you guard this traitor not to kick him, he said angrily in Castilian. Will you put us to open shame before these savages? Do so once more, and you shall pay for it smartly. 
learn a lesson in gentleness from that woman she is starving yet she leaves her food to help your prisoner to his feet now take him away to the camp and see that he comes to no harm for he can tell me much then the soldiers led me away grumbling as they went and the last thing that i saw was the despairing face of otomie my wife as she gazed after me faint with the secret agony of our parting but when i came to the head of the stairway guatemoc who stood near took my hand and shook it farewell brother he said with a heavy smile the game we play together is finished and now it is time for us to rest i thank you for your valour and your aid farewell guatemoc i answered you are fallen but let this comfort you in your fall you have found immortal fame on on growled the soldiers and i went thinking little how guatemoc and i should meet again they took me to a canoe and we were paddled across the lake by talascans till at length we came to a spanish camp all the journey through my guards though they laid no hand on me fearing the anger of cortes mocked and taunted me asking me how i liked the ways of the heathen and whether i ate the flesh of the sacrifice raw or cooked and many another such brutal jest they made at my expense for a while i bore it for i had learned to be patient from the indians but at last i answered them in a few words and bitter peace cowards i said remember that i am helpless and that were i before you strong and armed either i should not live to listen to such words or you would not live to repeat them then they were silent and i also was silent when we reached their camp i was led through it followed by a throng of fierce talascans and others who would have torn me limb from limb had they not feared to do so i saw some spaniards too but most of these were so drunk with mescal and with joy of the tidings that tenochtitlan had fallen and their labours were ended at last that they took no heed of me never did i see such madness as possessed them for these poor fools believed that henceforth they should eat their very bread of plates of gold it was for gold that they had followed cortes for gold they had braved the altar of sacrifice and fought in a hundred fights and now as they thought they had won it the room of the stone house where they prisoned me had a window secured by bars of wood and through these bars i could see and hear the revellings of the soldiers during the time of my confinement all day long when they were not on duty and most of the night also they gambled and drank staking tens of paces on a single throw which the loser must pay out of the share of countless treasures of the aztecs little did they care they won or lost they were so sure of plunder but played on till drink overpowered them and they rolled themselves senseless beneath the tables or till they sprang up and danced wildly to and fro catching at the sunbeams and screaming gold 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 listening at this window also i gathered some of the tidings of the camp i learned that cortes had come back bringing guatemoc and several of the princes with him together with many of the noble aztec ladies indeed i saw and heard the soldiers gambling for these women when they were weary of their play for money a description of each of them being written on a piece of paper one of these ladies answered well to otomie my wife and she was put up to auction by the brute who won her in the gamble and sold to a common soldier for a hundred pesos for these men never doubted that the women and the gold would be handed over to them 
Thus things went on for several days, during which I sat and slept in my prison, untroubled by any, except the native woman who waited on me and bought me food in plenty. During these days I ate as I had never eaten before, or since, and I slept much, for my sorrows could not rid my body of its appetites, and commanding need for food and rest. Indeed, I verily believe that at the end of a week I had increased weight by a full half. Also my weariness was conquered at length, and I was strong again. But when I was neither sleeping nor eating, I watched at my window, hoping, though in vain, to catch some sight of Otomie or Guatemoc. If I might not see my friends, however, at least I saw my foe. For one evening de Garcia came and stared at my prison. He could not see me, but I saw him and the devilish smile that flickered on his face as he went away, like a wolf, made me shiver with a presage of woes to come. For ten minutes or more he stood gazing at my window hungrily, as a cat gazes at a caged bird, and I felt that he was waiting for the door to be opened, and knew that it would be opened. This happened on the eve of the day upon which I was put to torture. Meanwhile, as I went on, I noticed that a change came over the temper of the camp. The soldiers ceased to gamble for untold wealth. They even ceased from drinking to excess, and from their riotous joy, but took to hanging together in knots, discussing fiercely I could not learn of what. On the day when de Garcia came to look at my prison, there was a great gathering in the square opposite my prison, to which I saw Cortes ride upon a white horse and richly dressed. The meeting was too far away for me to overhear what passed, but I noted that several officers addressed Cortes angrily, and that their speeches were loudly cheered by the soldiers. At length the great captain answered them at some length, and they broke up in silence. Next morning, after I had breakfasted, four soldiers came into my prison and ordered me to accompany them. Whither? I asked. To the captain, traitor, the leader answered. It has come at last, I thought to myself, but I said only, It is well. Any change from this hole is one for the better. Certainly, he replied, and it is your last shift. Then I knew that the man believed that I was going to my death. In five minutes I was standing before quarters in his private house, and at his sign was Marina, and around him were several of the companions in arms. The great man looked at me for a while, then spoke. Your name is Wingfield. You are of mixed blood, half English and half Spanish. You were cast away in the Tabasco River and taken to Tenochtitlan. There you were doomed to personate the Aztec god Tezcat, and were rescued by us when we captured the great Teocalli. Subsequently you joined the Aztecs and took part in the attack and slaughter of the Nostrist. You were afterwards the friends and counsellor of Guatemoc and assisted him in his defence of Tenochtitlan. Is this true, prisoner? It is all true, General, I answered. Good. You are now our prisoner, and had you a thousand lives, you have forfeited them all, because of your treachery to your race and blood. Into the circumstances that you led to commit this horrible treason I cannot enter. The facts remain. You have slain many of the Spaniards and their allies. That is, being in a state of treason, you have murdered them. Wingfield, 
your life is forfeit and i condemn you to die by hanging as a traitor and an apostate then there is nothing more to be said i answered quietly though a cold fear froze my blood there is something answered cortes though your crimes have been so many i am ready to give you your life and freedom upon a condition i am ready to do more to find you a passage to europe on the first occasion where you may perchance echo the echoes of your infamy if god is good to you the condition is this we have reason to believe that you are acquainted with the hiding place of the gold of montezuma which was unlawfully stolen from us on the night of the nostrist nay we know that this is so for you were seen to go with the canoes that were laden with it choose now apostate between a shameful death and the revealing to us of the secret of this treasure for a moment i wavered on the one hand was the loss of honour with life and liberty and the hope of home on the other a dreadful end then i remembered my oath and otomie and what she would think of me living or dead if i did this thing and i wavered no more i know nothing of the treasure general i answered coldly send me to my death you mean that you will say nothing of it traitor think again if you have sworn any oaths they are broken by god the empire of the aztecs is at an end their king is my prisoner their great city is in ruin the true god has triumphed over these devils by my hand their wealth is my lawful spoil and i must have it to pay my gallant comrades who cannot grow rich on desolation now think again i know nothing of this treasure general yet memory sometimes wakens traitor i have said that you shall die if yours should fail you and so you shall to be sure but death is not always swift there are means doubtless you who have lived in spain have heard of them and he arched his brows and glared at me meaningfully by which a man may die and yet live for many weeks now loath as i am to do it it seems that if your memory still sleeps i must find some means to rouse it before you die i am in your power general i answered you call me traitor again and again i am no traitor i am a subject of the king of england not of the king of spain i came hither following a villain who has wrought me and mine bitter wrong one of your company named agassier or sarcader to find him and for other reasons i joined the aztecs they are conquered and i am your prisoner at the least deal with me as a brave man deals with a fallen enemy i know nothing of the treasure kill me and make an end as a man i might wish to do this wingfield but i am more than a man i am the hand of the church here in anahuac you have partaken with the worshippers of idols you have seen your fellow christians sacrificed and devoured by your brute comrades for this alone you deserve to be tortured eternally and doubtless that will be so after we have done with you as for the hidalgo don sarqueda i know him only as a brave companion in arms and certainly i shall not listen to tales told against him by a wandering apostate it is however unlucky for you and here a gleam of light shot across the face of cortes that there should be any feud between you seeing that it is to his charge that i am about to confide you 
now for the last time i say choose will you reveal the hiding place of the treasure and go free or will you be handed over to the care of don sarqueda till such a time as he shall find means to make you speak now a great faintness seized me for i knew that i was condemned to be tortured and that de garcia was to be my torturer what mercy had i to expect from his cruel heart when i his deadliest foe lay in his power to wreak his vengeance on but still my will and honour prevailed against my terrors and i answered i have told you general that i know nothing of this treasure do your worst and may god forgive you for your cruelty dare not to speak the holy name apostate and worshipper of idols eater of human flesh let sarqueda be summoned a messenger went out and for a while there was silence i caught marina's glance and saw pity in her gentle eyes but she could not help me hear for cortes was mad because no gold had been found and the clamour of the soldiers for reward had worn him out and brought him to this shameful remedy he who was not cruel by nature still she strove to plead for me with him whispering earnestly in his ear for a while cortes listened then he pushed her from him roughly peace marina he said what shall i spare this english dog some pangs when my command and perchance my very life hangs upon the finding of the gold nay he knows well where it lies hid you said it yourself when i would have hung him for a traitor and certainly he was one of those whom the spy saw go out with it upon the lake our friend was with them also but he came back no more oh doubtless they murdered him what is this man to you that you should plead for him oh cease to trouble me marina am i not troubled enough already and cortes put his hands to his face and remained lost in thought as for marina she looked at me sadly and sighed as though to say i have done my best and i thanked her with my eyes presently there was a sound of footsteps and i looked up to see de garcia standing before me time and hardship had touched him lightly and the lines of silver in his curling hair and peaked beard did but add dignity to his noble presence indeed when i looked at him in his dark spanish beauty his rich garments decked with chains of gold as he bowed before cortes hat in hand i was fain to confess that i had never seen a more gallant cavalier or one whose aspect gave the lie so wholly to his black heart within but knowing him for what he was my very blood quivered with hate at the sight of him and when i thought of my own impotence and of the errand on which he had come i ground my teeth and cursed the day that i was born as for de garcia he greeted me with a little cruel smile then spoke to cortes your pleasure general greetings to you comrade answered cortes you know this renegade oh but too well general three times he has striven to murder me well you have escaped and it is your hour now sarqueda he says that he has a quarrel with you what is it de garcia hesitated stroking his peaked beard then answered i am loath to tell it because it is a tale of error for which i have often sorrowed and done penance yet i will speak for fear you should think worse of me than i deserve this man has some cause to mislike me since to be frank when i was younger than i am to-day and given to the follies of youth it chanced that in england 
I met his mother, a beautiful Spanish lady who by ill fortune was wedded to an Englishman. This man's father and a clown of clowns, who maltreated her. I will be short. The lady learned to love me, and I worsted her husband in a duel. Hence this traitor's hate of me. I heard, and thought that my heart must burst with fury. To all his wickedness and offences against me, de Garcia had now added slander of my dead mother's honour. You lie, murderer, I gasped, tearing at the ropes that bound me. I must ask you to protect me from such insult, General, de Garcia answered coldly. Were the prisoner worthy of my sword, I would ask further that his bonds should be loose for a little space, but my honour would be tarnished for ever, were I to fight with such as he. Dare to speak once more to a gentleman of Spain, said Cortes coldly, and you, heathen dog, your tongue shall be dragged from you with red-hot pincers. For you, Sarcada, I thank you for your confidence. If you have no worse crime than a love affair upon your soul, I think that our good chaplain Almeida will frank you through the purgatorial fires. But we waste words and time. This man has the secret of the treasure of Guatemoc and of Montezuma. If Guatemoc and his nobles will not tell it, he at least may be forced to speak for the torments that an Indian can endure without a groan will soon bring truth bubbling from the lips of this white heathen. Take him, Sarkeda, and hearken. Let him be your special care. First let him suffer with the others, and afterwards, should he prove obdurate, alone. The methods I leave to you. Should he confess, then summon me. Oh, pardon me, General, but this is no task for an Hildago of Spain. I have been more wont to pierce my enemies with the sword than to pierce them with pincers, said de Garcia, but as he spoke I saw a gleam of triumph shine in his black eyes, and heard the ring of triumph through the mock anger of his voice. I know it, comrade, but this must be done. Though I hate it, it must be done. There is no other way. The gold is necessary to me. By the mother of God, the knaves say that I have stolen it. And I doubt these stubborn Indian dogs will ever speak, however great their agony. This man knows, and I give him over to you, because you are acquainted with his wickedness, and that knowledge will steel your heart against all pity. Spare not, comrade. Remember that he must be forced to speak. Oh, it is your command, Cortes, and I will obey it, though I love the task little. With one proviso, however, that you give me your warrant in writing. It shall be made out at once, answered the general. And now away with him. Where to? To the prison that he has left. All is ready, and there he will find his comrades. Then the guard was summoned, and I was dragged back to my own place. De Garcia saying as I went that he would be with me presently. End of chapter 28 Recording by Patrick 79